up on this week's show, the Sega Saturn becomes a fashion statement. The biggest Nintendo Wii ever. And we get the inside story on Montezuma's Revenge with Rob Yeager. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you every Friday with our great friends at Bitmap Books. Now, if you want some reading over summer, definitely check out their book, I'm Too Young to Die, The Ultimate Guide to First-Person Shooters. Covering the rise of the FPS from 1992 to 2002, the all-time classics, failed experiments, some obscure hidden gems as well, and exclusive interviews with the people who made them. You can check that out on the rest of their retro gaming collection at bitmapbooks.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 381, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to the podcast that every single Friday takes you deep inside the world of classic video games, talking to the people who made it all happen back in the day, getting the inside story, and of course, bringing you up to speed on all the big happenings, the big headlines from the world of retro gaming and technology from over the last seven days. Because, you know, we're all busy. Who's got time to check out Twitter and Facebook every single day, apart from us guys? We do it for you. So uh, we'll bring you up to speed on what's been happening in just a minute and an amazing guest in the second half of the podcast. Now, we are recording this on a uh, beautiful, sunny Saturday afternoon. Sun shining. Joe's dragged himself in away from the paddling pool. (laughs) Ravi's put the tongs down on the barbecue because we've got an incredible guest that we're really excited to talk to this week. Now, we're going to be uh, going over to New Jersey to talk to someone I was hanging out with in Poland a couple of weeks ago. And I guess this week is... Rob Yeager. Now, as soon as we got off this um, interview, Ravi was just, he messaged me and said, wow, that was an amazing interview. We weren't so in-depth in this one. Yeah, it, it was really interesting because he started doing video games when he's very young and it's like his dad, you know, helped him get into it and took him out to video game shows and then eventually got a contract with uh, Parker Brothers, you know, the uh, mm. famous board game uh, creators. Yeah, really interesting interview. And this is about a title I didn't know much about because uh, it's it's in a world, the world of Atari, which is uh, really fantastic to to hear about. And it's uh, Montezuma's Revenge, which is uh, an actual expression for, uh, you know, going to uh, Mexico and getting some bad food. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, you do not want Montezuma's Revenge in real life. No. In <laughs> um, but the game itself, I mean, it's definitely a bit of a cult classic. And yeah, I mean, you know, as we, as we hear from Rob, really, it, it found its home on the Atari 400, 800 computers back in the day. Uh, it was ported to a lot of different systems as well. But in particular, I mean, it, it, it's got a real big following in places like Poland, which um, was a reason that I met him at Pixel Heaven. Um, in Poland when I was out there at Warsaw a couple of weeks ago. He went on stage and did a panel, and I thought, this is such an interesting talk. We need to get Rob on the podcast. And like you said, I mean, he had a contract with Parker Brothers, and I must admit, I wasn't really all that aware that they were much of a player in the video games industry back in the day, because we know them for, you know, Monopoly and Scrabble and games like that. But in that pre-1984 video games crash in North America, they were actually, you know, one of the big players for a while until they... They left the industry. So it's really interesting to hear kind of how he worked with them. And also, you know, like the industry was a lot back then, some of the the corners they kind of cut just to get games out there. I mean, he wasn't too happy with the way the game was released back in the day. Uh, But actually, luckily, I mean, with today's technology, the game's actually coming back again. He's doing a special director's cut that is going to be designed for the original hardware again, which is very cool, and a brand new version of it that's going to be updated for modern consoles as well. So 40 years later, he's basically realising that initial dream that he had as a teenager when he made the first Montezuma's Revenge. It's it's really interesting, yeah. And I've also read that, um, you know, OpenAI and AI was, this was one of the games that AI was using to learn on. Right. Um, So uh, Montezuma's (laughs) Revenge and Pitfall, which is uh, pretty epic. Well, the rise of Skynet will blame Rob for that, but uh, for now we can just enjoy the game. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it is incredible to hear his story. And, uh, you know, he set up his own company, Utopia Software, when he was a teenager. And, uh, I mean, you'd enjoy this game, Joe. I'm not sure whether you're, you're familiar with it, but it's kind of what we go on to call a Metroidvania-style game, which I know is right up your street. Oh, right, cool. No, yeah, um, I've never actually heard of it or uh, played it, so this is going to be really interesting. But, yeah, any, any sort of early Metroidvania game, uh, right up my street. So that sounds really cool. 
yeah, and it's going to be coming out on like Switch and you know all the uh, the current consoles um, at the end of the year, early next year. And he actually made a new version of it for the NES. Oh, nice. There's a new version that came out on the, the NES a couple of years ago as well. So we'll hear all about that with this week's special guest, Rob Yeager, the man behind the classic Montezuma's Revenge. He'll be our special guest on the show in around half an hour from now. Now, it has been another busy week in the world of retro gaming and technology. Let's uh, update you on some of the biggest stories from the week. And uh, if you're like me, and occasionally you pop on eBay, and uh, I don't know about you guys, sometimes I just go on eBay, I'll type in Amiga, I'll type in, you know, Atari Jaguar, and just kind of see what comes up. It's, it's too if dangerous you- for me, Dan. I don't go on it anymore because it's, <laughs> it's like one of these things, you know, Especially, oh God, have you ever been on eBay drunk? Uh, that is not something yes. <laughs> that I advise. Waking up uh, the next day and being like, I won it. Oh my God. <laughs> what am I going to do now? I use getting drunk as an excuse to go on eBay. Like, I kind of rub my hands right. together, like, I'm going to have a drink tonight, going to go on eBay because I can't bring myself to spend money as it is. <laughs> How come I remortgage the house? Oh God. <laughs> well, Joe, for this one, you might need quite a few cans of cider to fork mm. out for this Mega Drive game that just went for nearly £8,000 on eBay. Yeah, man, this has been doing the rounds all this week. Um, I think it finished Monday, maybe Sunday night. So, uh, you know, good for (laughs) drunk bidding on a Saturday night. But yeah, this game is uh, Lakers versus Celtics, uh, which has sold for £7,870. Fancy that for a Mega Drive game there. You know, Especially one that, I mean, to me, this looks like a pretty generic... It looks it looks very game. niche though. Like so, if you're looking at it, it's the NBA playoffs, mm-hmm. but Lakers versus Celtics. So it's that very specific kind of mm. time in NBA, and you know, with these two teams. So yeah, I, and, you know, I guess that's what probably makes it rare. Well, no, not quite. There's, there is quite an in-depth story behind this, and it's a bit of a, a holy grail kind of like it's it's a hard one because i i it kind of writes off kind of sega mega drive collecting to an extent as well and you know in terms of like is it official is it unofficial so like you say ravi it's a bit of a random obscure game and from the outside looking in it's an it's an ea sports game for the mega drive like a five to ten pound game you know to the untrained eye and also it did come out on genesis and the Genesis version, I think, uses the same cartridge because um, it doesn't actually say on the cartridge whether it's Mega Drive or Genesis. Um, correct me if I'm wrong there. But that's what I've been informed by uh, my insider resources. Um, and in America, it's not a rare game whatsoever. Right. However, in the UK, there is apparently only 14 of them known to be in the community. Okay. Ah, okay, so these are the PAL versions. This then. is the PAL version of the game. So the game was never meant to be released in shops, okay? Um, and what what happened was in 1991, when the, when the game was being made, um, well, nobody really knows the exact story, but in, tw- in 2017, somebody who used to work for EA, I forget his name, but he used to work for EA in the 90s, um, his boss, uh, he helped him, helped him, his boss move house in like 2017, um, and he worked for EA, from like 1994 and this this boss who he helped move house he always got a copy of every single game that EA would bring out you know no matter what the console was and when he was moving house he said I've got these tubs and tubs and tubs and tubs of Mega Drive games and you know just games you can have them mate like sell them off as payment kind of thing you know take a cut um, and he ended up selling a copy of Lakers vs Celtics for just over £8,000 in 2017 and he wow. was like, right, I need to look into this because what is this game like? People people were coming out of the woodworks offering him, you know, he initially put it up like as part of a bundle and everybody started messaging him like, I'll give you a thousand pound for it by now. So he was like, right, I need to research this. So what it kind of turned out was that there was a licensing issue when it came to releasing this game with players in Europe. So like the licensing issue was for bringing the game out in Europe for the American players, I believe. Um, hmm. So the game never came out. So it's it's kind of heavily rumoured that the copies that kind of got out were for review copies for like magazines and stuff like that. However, right. the the boss of the guy dug out a sales sheet from from EA, you know, from from the season of nineteen ninety one, and apparently there was a hundred and ninety two copies of it made and sent out slash sold. So there's only one hundred and ninety two copies, but only fourteen of them 
are known to be in the community to oh. be in hands of collectors, <laughs> which is why it's driving up the price. And it's one of them of, is it part of the official full Mega Drive Power library? So I've mentioned before my friend Jason, very close to a full library. And I'm like, dude, is this part of the library? It's ten, it's, He's like, no, yeah. of course it's not. For, and we for, actually, for completionists, though, this is like yeah, you yeah. Know, the Holy Grail. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, we've actually seen a copy um, at the, not the last Birmingham Games Market, but the one before. Um, Vintage Gamer is a shop, fantastic shop in uh, just outside of Birmingham. They had a stall and they had mm. a copy of it on the back. And Jason got like, he had one of those moments like, oh my God, I'm about to get Celtics. <laughs> like I'm about to get it. And he was like, yo, how much is it? And the guy was like, oh, it's not really for sale. I've kind of brought it just for like to show off. And he was like, Jason was like, how much? Thinking he was going to say like 300 quid, 500 quid. And he was like, I'd take 10,000 for it. Oh um, my God. And at the time you're like, what? But then you look at the listings, you know, 7,870 sold for 8,000 in 2017. I saw a private sale of it on Instagram for about 4,000 last year. But obviously it's just circumstantial. I guess, you know, maybe that person wanted, wanted to make sure it sold. So they, I think it was like 3,800 or something. But yeah, apparently from my research, it's 14 in the hands of collectors. I don't know who's wow. bought this one, but it's just mental. You know, it's a sports game for the Mega Drive. <laughs> well, it turns out that the um, the guy who found this game was Dave David Armour, his okay. name was. Um, right, yeah. And there's an interview with him on uh, Eurogamer magazine. Mm. Um, and he worked for Relentless Software for a few years as well. So um, if you want to hear more about kind of where you know, the story of how he found that, there's a nice little interview with him on Eurogamer. Uh, it is really interesting, though, to look at this game because, I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, the basketball fan anyway you know it's yeah. not really my thing um but i'm looking at you know some of the people who are involved in this game rob hubbard did the music the oh, commodore 64 legend so um i've got rob's email address i might ping him and say you know the games you worked on i suppose you've got a copy of this <laughs> yeah he might do your uh, your dusty loft somewhere <laughs> have you so. <laughs> so but you know the thing is it's kind of one of those games isn't it where unless you knew the history of it mm. I wouldn't assume that to be rare. Or you no, know, if, you I, wouldn't, if would I was you? in like, yeah, if I didn't know about this and I saw that, like a, a car boot sale or something, I'd, that's one that I'd pass by. Yeah, absolutely. and I wonder how many of these are just kind of lurking in yeah. people's garages and that kind of thing. You know, they yeah. don't know the value. Yeah, exactly. You know, 192. I, I, I would say, as have a guess, maybe they did go out to developers and the producers of the game and stuff. You know, mm. maybe some of them went to review, went out for review. Some of them probably landed in the hands of the dev team. And they're just sat in attics, probably, um, or just like you say, ended up in a car boot sale and nobody's buying it. <laughs> you know, just sat there, you know, just not selling. Now, Joe, I, I've got a question for you. So I, I know you occasionally do inventories on your games. Have you actually looked through? I mean, after you read the story, you're like, have I got a copy of that? Oh, have I, you I, I know I haven't got a copy of this. 100%. No, I haven't got a yeah. copy. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm on a quest to, re- like, to get the boxed versions of all of my loose cart Mega Drive games so I know exactly what I've got at the moment. And yeah, I've definitely not got this. <laughs> yeah, there's probably going to be a few people there checking the attics and garages mm-hmm. this weekend mm-hmm. after that story. So uh, if you want to read more about that, I'll, uh, I'll link it up in our show notes. Now, what about this for, uh, you know, often we talk about mods on this podcast, many of which are functional. You know, we, we hear about people turning you know, basically living room consoles into handhelds. I think it's very cool. Some of them are a bit more uh, esoteric, you could say. This one is... Uh, I don't know why I find this so cool, but it's possibly the most pointless mod <laughs> that I've ever seen Ooh. for a Nintendo Wii. This is someone who's basically doubled the size of the Wii. I think it's beautiful, this is. <laughs> in, a world, <laughs> in a world where we're seeing people like hack down machines, make them smaller, um, go in the opposite direction and, and making something bigger is pretty cool, to be honest. Like, uh, you say it doesn't do much, but there's some quite like smart ideas in here. Um mm. I, I'm really tempted to do this with the Wii U, uh, but this is a uh, by uh, some people called Bringer Studios, and it's uh, the Wii XL. Um, it's it's a huge Wii. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it's maybe the size of like a large shoebox or something. Looking at the it, size, it, but so it says it's a two to three scale or twelve times larger in volume. So I would say you 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 kind of hit the nail on the head before we started recording. Imagine a normal Wii, but it accepts vinyls. Yeah. Like, like in terms <laughs> yeah. of the size. <laughs> but um, laser laser discs. Discs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I think a lot of the reason that this has been done is because I've got the Wii U downstairs, which is even worse than this. But um, you have so many different bits coming off the Wii. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like a lot of people have external hard drives in there. A lot of people have even the power supply, the power pack for the Wii is quite big. 
Mm. And um, this is a, a little solution kind of for that. So they've got the Wii a in li- them. A little solution. <laughs> <laughs> a big, yeah. yeah. A 12 times bigger solution. <laughs> a kind of tidier solution then, I guess. Um, they've got a, a Wii in there, but they've also got the, the power pack built mm. into this unit. They've, they've put in a, a fan at the back yeah. um, to keep everything cool inside this box. But interestingly, they've built a little adapter so that the fan can be powered from the USB on the Wii. And um, you have to remember that the the Wii USB is like, a lot of the times it requires a hub mm. or, you know, to, to, to be able to put extra stuff in there. So they've got access to more USB uh, drives at the back with this hub. They've also got a HDMI converter in there oh, built nice. in. So, um, you know, the Wii's output is then going through the HDMI. So actually, with this unit, you've got power supply in there, bit of fan, bit of, you know, converting and uh, some more USB stuff. So it is quite useful. And I think the fact that somebody's kind of done this at home with a 3D printer and, and created this is is quite cool. I'm always a fan of making stuff bigger. I used to remember people making huge Game Boys and stuff, and that's always... <laughs> I don't know, it just makes it seem more yeah. fun. Yeah, you, you go to these, like, cool bars, and they'll have, like, the giant Game Boy on the wall to play while you've had a drink. It'd be interesting to see a giant Wii set up, you, you know, in one of these bars. <laughs> yeah, like, how many have I had? Um, but like, like Ravi says, it's, it's fully functioning. It's not actually lost any of the original Wii's capabilities, so the GameCube player is still in there as well. So it's yeah, a fully functioning yeah. GameCube as well still. Um, and he's, he's got a little flap ports. at the side for access as well yeah. to get to yeah. get to all of those um, the, uh, GameCube ports. The only oversight he had, he said after he made it, was the sync button for the Wii remotes. Oh, yeah, it, that's it doesn't annoying. have a sync button. However, you can get to it through the, uh, the, disc, like the disc slot because obviously the disc slot is so huge. But then, obviously, the actual <laughs> disc bit is just a normal, you know, normal size CD-ROM disc, DVD disc. You can actually put your finger in and press the sync button on the Wii that's inside <laughs> nice. of it, so you can get. That to goes it. against everything I got told as a kid. Don't put your finger inside those. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'd love to see like a, a giant PlayStation Two, like a vertical standing one that's also a portal. Like a monolith as big as a house. Like a, yeah, that's like a portal that you could open. Oh yeah. <laughs> You know what, though? Because a lot of people in the comments are like, oh, I couldn't fit this on my table or whatever. But to be fair, it's probably not much bigger or maybe about the same size of PS5. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah, yeah that's yeah. a pretty beastly console anyway. You know, so, I uh, think if, if this was the Wii U, you know, I've got so many things coming off there. And uh, even if it had a little like slot for the gamepad or something to sit in, um, it, it would be quite useful, actually. <laughs> So it is a very cool video if you want to check out the uh, the real size. Uh, actually, this is um, it, it says two times size Wii U, but apparently in terms of volume, it's twelve times larger than the original Wii. So if you want to check that out, I'll, uh, I'll put that video and of course the rest of the stories. You can check them all out at theretrohour.com. Now, one thing about retro gaming back in the day that was always a big struggle for me was uh, finding a decent joystick. For my machine, I went through so many crappy Cheetah 125s and, you know, those joysticks your mum would pick up in the shop for like a fiver and she'd bring home and it lasted last like a week. And today, I think, you know, we, we all treat our retro systems with a bit more respect and like to treat them to a decent controller for when we're playing our retro games. And someone who's on a mission to really improve the classic joystick and the experience for our retro systems is Andrew, who you might know from uh, the Twitch channel Amiga for Mortals, who has just launched a brand new Kickstarter for these incredible incredible joysticks um, that really, I mean, uh, this idea came out of you wanting, similar to me, Andrew, wanting to find a decent joystick for the Amiga back in the day. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I um, When I started getting back into uh, the Amiga a few years ago, um, I just couldn't find anything that, that felt right to me. So I, I just wanted to create something that was a bit better than, than, than what I'd been able to find. Yeah, well, I mean, I met you last year and, and thank you for taking the time to come on the show and talk to us. Um, I was on your stand at OLL in Norwich last year where I got a bit of a hands-on preview of your your sticks. So tell us a bit about this project then and the Kickstarter and the the immortal joystick then. Yeah, so um, uh, yeah, it's, it started off um, I, years and years ago. I used to build uh, guitar stomp boxes um, and so I'd, I'd use sort of metal enclosures for those and when I decided to build a joystick, I just thought, well, I know that arcade quality parts are are the way to go. And I just needed to find a decent way of housing them. 
So I found a larger stomp box type enclosure, a metal enclosure that I could um, to fit them into. And I just uh, built a test one really and just uh, had a go of it. And it, it, it seemed good to me. I was quite pleased with it. Um, and then I spoke to a couple of different streamers. I think Hitch was the first person who, who really sort of um, uh, decided that he really liked it. And um, uh, he bought one off of me uh, and I sent one over to him in Norway and uh, he sort of helped me refine it a little bit. And uh, yeah, it just sort of went from there. Well, give us the um, the specs then of these stick sinks. I mean, when I was playing with it last year at OLL, I've got to say it just felt really well made and really felt like, yeah, like you mentioned, they, like the proper arcade experience. Yeah, so I'm using um, a, a Sanwa um, joystick. Um, the ball top and the buttons um, at the minute are either Sanwa or Sumitsu, um, depending on uh, colour choices. Um, and that's something I, I still need to work out with the manufacturer exactly how we're going to offer different colour choices. Um, they've got a braided cable with um, a moulded uh, DB9 connector on, so they're compatible with um, anything that uses the 9-pin Atari standard, so uh, all the Amigas, um, ZX Spectrum using the Kempston interface, all the Ataris, Commodore VIC-20, C64, even the Sega Master System. Um, because the buttons are directly wired to the pins, um, there's uh, no latency, um, there's no PCB to interfere with the signal. Um, the only PCB that is in the joystick is just for the auto fire, um, and that's a custom board that's been designed specifically for the Immortal joystick. And it uh, is a PCB that doesn't um, require the power, so it's um, a, a passive uh, auto fire. Um, and then I've also um, got a switch on there so that you can uh, map up to the second button for those uh, up to jump games. Um, but it keeps up functioning as well. So if you've got a game where you're using uh, up to jump, but you're also using up to go up ladders or through doors or things like that, you can still use up as well as the button. I, That's handy. I, I think it's got some really nice like little features like that, but also... One thing that's really good is the braided cables as well, because I <laughs> I use my joysticks and I pull them around and kind of wreck the cables quite a lot. So it's good to have that um, extra protection in there. Yeah, I think that's sort of uh, the, the whole thing that I wanted to achieve with this is for it to be a quality premium product. That that was what I was going for, the whole thing. And when I made the first couple, I didn't have the braided cables at that point, and it just felt to me like that was the thing that that let the whole thing down. So um, when when I started doing the braiding braided cables, it was a no-brainer, really. It made a huge difference. Well, this is running on Kickstarter right now, and um, you've got – it's a couple of days in at the time when this episode comes out, so um, literally just at the start of your Kickstarter. So if people want to support this, get on this right now. Um, obviously, Kickstarter is – you know, you've got to get it back to make this happen. So if you want a really good joystick for your classic systems – please do support this. So tell us a bit about the re rewards you're offering on Kickstarter, because obviously that's always a big part of any campaign. Yeah. So I've got, um, I've got sort of some of the basic stuff, really. I've got um, sort of some t-shirts, um, uh, early bird discounted joysticks, um, and then some of the, um, the bigger packages. So I've got a, a limited edition, uh, like a collector's edition, um, where you can get a, a Hoffman um, Cave Sessions vinyl with it as well. Um, there's, it's going nice. to be a special colorway specifically for the collector's edition you also get a, a mug and a t-shirt with that um, and i'm going to hand sign in uh, inside each of the cases there's also then going to be a, a legend edition which is going to be um, gold buttons and ball top again you get the hoffman uh, vinyl uh, these ones are going to be signed by hoffman as well also with a t-shirt and a mug and uh, the uh, hand signed and then there's going to be a one one-off hero edition um and for this one you get all, all of the other stuff that i've mentioned uh the hoffman finally is actually going to have a personalized message as well but the big difference with this one is i've partnered up with uh raw talent art i don't know if you guys have seen them on instagram but they do custom paint jobs generally on old consoles and stuff and they're incredible the the uh, the paint jobs that they do on uh, on these consoles are, are amazing. And I'm going to partner up with him to do a custom paint job on one joystick enclosure. Um, so right. whoever goes for that can 
uh, can specify what it is that they want on the joystick and we can get that that made specially for them. That is some serious bragging rights as well. Yeah, the only one in the world to have that. So uh, yeah, for very sure. cool. And I'm looking at, you know, the people who have already endorsed it, Amiga Bill, saying, you know, it's a bit like an absolute tank. You dropped it on the floor and the floor lost. <laughs> and uh, Retro Hitch, he said, you know, the best damn retro joystick money can buy, pure quality. So, and I think there is so many of us out there, you know, I've, I've got a zip stick that I use on my Amiga, but I've had, had it 30 years and it's starting to wear away. And, you know, these things aren't built to last forever. And if you just want a real arcade experience, I mean, I've got to say, um, this thing looks absolutely incredible. So, uh, and you're going to be at Ravi's event as well, aren't you? A Kickstarter in Nottingham in, in July. People want to come and say hello in person. Yeah, that's right. I'm uh, Hopefully I'm going to be there with um, a couple, couple of Amigas, a few of the joysticks for people to try out. Um, I've, I've had a chat with Hoffman and we're going to have his um, Seekanoid game uh, running um, with a, a dual joystick set up. So uh, that should be quite interesting as well. So yeah, people should have um, an opportunity to give them a go. Uh, and that will be uh, sort of during the last week um, of the Kickstarter. So, um, sort yeah. of following the event, people will still have a few days to uh, to back the joystick if they want to. Yeah, but obviously everyone needs to jump on this this weekend if you want to treat your retro systems to uh, the joystick that really will do your classic games justice. The Immortal Joysticks now running on a Kickstarter, and of course I'll uh, I'll link that up in our show notes as well, so people can click th- straight through to it. So, uh, best of luck, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. Now, I'm heading away on holiday soon, so I've uh, been out, you know, went to Meadow Hall in Sheffield after I finished work on Friday, you know, wandering around the shops, getting a few T-shirts and stuff to take away with me. Getting your uh, uh, Speedos. (laughs) (laughs) Beach ready. No one wants to see that, Ravi. Um, But yeah, that's the thing. I mean, when you're looking at fashion on the high street, you know, know, it's generally a little bit boring sometimes, isn't it? Occasionally, I remember when Primark had the the Commodore t-shirts and hoodies in a couple of years ago and the Atari stuff that was quite cool there's a few PlayStation t-shirts and stuff I've got as well I must admit in the uh, the fashion retailer Zara which is not a place I go very often but um, I might have to make a little wander into there in the next couple of weeks because apparently for some reason they're selling Sega Saturn branded fashion items yeah this seems very bizarre I, I really really want one of these but it is very bizarre um, can't say Zara is a shop I go into. My wife goes I, into I, Zara. I, I went <laughs> into Zara and I bought a, a, a jumper there, and I think it was the smallest, tightest jumper I've ever bought in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, these sizes are not similar to <laughs> the usual <laughs> sizes we use. Yeah, we're not. We're not. We're, well, I'm looking at the images here as well, and I mean, to me, I always assumed that Zara was more a, a female clothing shop. I mean, I didn't. Do they do guys? Yeah, they, they, yeah, they do yeah, guys. yeah, yeah, yeah. They oh, do okay. guys stuff, but. They also do Sega Saturn bum bags now. <laughs> now the that's what we call them in, in England, bum bags. Bum bags, fanny packs. Yeah, um, yeah, which sounds totally wrong in British. Yeah. <laughs> now the article I've read said they were only available in North America. However, done a bit more digging, a bit more research, and uh, they were available in the UK as well. And they are on their website. They're in the kids section, so they're actually classed as a children's bag. And interestingly, they're designed after the white mk2 japanese console so it's the sega saturn controller but it's the white one with like the green and pink and blue button i think it is or green pink and yellow i can't remember what buttons it is and it's about the size of a game gear because somebody's actually posted a picture that they've bought one and put their game gear in it which i that's pretty love. cool yeah i, I think uh, you know it's uh it might be one of these items that appeals to people that are like just into retro stuff yeah. but don't really know about it you know oh it's got sega on it i don't know what it's from um i'm still gonna wear it as like a fashion accessory yeah. which, which is cool like uh yeah right i kind of think uh i'm seeing more people going around with stuff i remember for years people were going with with nasa t-shirts and i was yeah like, yeah i remember that i was yeah. like do you know what nasa stands for <laughs> <laughs> one of them <laughs> well, yeah. well, there, is a, there is a tweet here by um, a guy called play sushi uk who apparently drove himself last week to the nottingham branch of zara to pick one up oh mate he's bought them yeah. all out before he's, we bought them out. It, them. It, yeah. he's tweeted that it was it was the last one as well but they are still available online yeah. they're 17.99 so they're not the cheapest mm. little bum bags but I really want one because I've been doing my uh, game events and selling games, haven't I? So I want one, like, for my money. Like, you know, like, like, like kind of Del Boy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but interestingly, they haven't, like, I, I don't know if it's an official announcement or anything like that, but I found some Japanese tweets from Zara that the Mega Drive handbag is coming as well to Zara. Wow. So, you know, keep your eyes peeled for that one. 
so maybe maybe you might spot me down and Ravi sporting some handbags shaped like Mega Drives. Yeah, man, event. a man bag, <laughs> handbag. I don't mind. That is one thing, cause I know bum bags have had a bit of a resurgence mm. in recent That's probably years. It, I yeah. see all the. Well, I see all the teenagers walking around my village wearing them, but they don't wear them round the, the waist. They, they wear them over their shoulders. shoulders. Yeah. And that, a, and that's yeah. a roadman bag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it's what a, I've it's seen. It's a belly bag. This is yeah. what I've seen these, these tweets uh, with the Sega Saturn controller bag. That's what I've seen people, you know, these cool kids, they're wearing it over their shoulder. Like, so it's on their chest. Like on the it's, it's like, uh, what, I'd wear it like wearing a one bag. strap of your backpack back in the yeah. days at school, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> They don't wear them uh, under the belly like we used to. <laughs> well, that's the thing. If Joe gets one of these, now you're a dad as well, Joe. You've got to wear it, you know, round it, round your belly. You've got to have your... Uh, oh, yeah. You've you basically got to have your sandals and your socks mm-hmm. pulled up as well. Mm-hmm. You know, 100%. maybe your you rolls of coins in there for your holiday. Your file of facts. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. my bucket hat, my sunglasses, and then yeah. just sun cream on my nose. I'm, I'm, I'm there, man. I'm, I'm s- sandals with socks as well. Sandals yeah. with socks with my shorts on. I am here for it. <laughs> so, I mean, it is bizarre that, yeah, fashion retailer in 2023 that is doing a brand named at Kids is doing official Sega Saturn merchandise, but I'm not complaining about this. Um, I think it's very cool. And, uh, yeah, I mean... I thought originally, you know, I, I don't really wear bags when I go out, but yeah, for something like uh, holding your Sega Game Gear or something in there, that would be a very cool little bag for it, wouldn't it? So um, yeah, it does look awesome. So if you do manage to get hold of one of those, uh, please maybe drop us a little tweet and let us know uh, where you managed to find next. I've got a feeling they're going to sell out rather quickly. Now, um, this is very cool as well. We always uh, kind of cover these um, mini arcades, which I've got a few of these, and it's always cool when our favourite games get brought back in this kind of miniature tabletop arcade form. And uh, this is the latest one from uh, the Quarter Arcade series. And this is the legendary Konami's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fighting game from back in the day. Yeah, these are these are really good fun. And I know you guys are Total Turtles fans as well. So mm. <laughs> it's kind of your jam. Um, they're these little tiny quarter arcades. You know, um, I, I, I've never tried one. Have, have you guys actually played with one of them? Yeah, they're, they're pretty cool. So just to be, when because Ravi sent this over to me, when he said quarter arcade, I thought he meant as in like, you put a quarter in it, like the coin, but it's a quarter of the size, isn't it? It's a one-fourth yeah. scale um, size. Yeah, it's like, numskull yeah, arcades, numskull isn't it? Arcades. Numskull designs yeah. are releasing these. Yeah, I've played the uh, like the Pac-Man ones, and uh, I think there was maybe a Joust one or something like that. They are pretty cool. Um, they are on a small size, but if you're somebody like me who's got big fat hands, uh, they do offer a controller pad with it as well, which is kind of designed. Yeah, it looks like you NES can uh, stick a USB pad in there and, yeah. and and then play it. So you're not forced to play on the, the tiny joysticks, even though I think it would be quite good fun to play yeah. with those little joysticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are going to probably be a little bit like these Sega Saturn uh, bum bags. They are quite limited, so I can see these selling out quite quickly. There's only going to be 350 of the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game. And then they are also doing 150 units of Turtles in Time as well. Um, yeah, I think so. um, these these are quite special because they're signed by um, uh, the co-creator, Kevin oh, Eastman. So oh, uh, yeah, yeah. the co-creator of Teenage Mutant Ninja mm. Turtles. And they've also got like Nickelodeon branding as well, which I've not really seen associated with that brand. It, Nickelodeon, Maybe, no, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So did they end up buying it then? Yeah, they bought they bought Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, I'm not sure when, um, but they've owned them for a while. So I know mm. the there's a is it called Mutant Mayhem, the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles film that's coming out this summer, um, which is a, you know a cartoon, an animated one, and it's like Nickelodeon's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So I think everything now, which is associated with TMNT, is it's Nickelodeon's TMNT. But this isn't the new design. This is the the, the the radical 89 game and uh, Turtles in Time from the early 90s as well. So which uh, games were these originally for then? Were They they were, were arcade they games. They were, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Were, they were coin up arcade games. They did get ports for like the NES and the SNES and there was a... And the Amiga. And the Amiga. Which is terrible. And there was a Mega Drive <laughs> version called Hyperstone Heist. Um, but these are the arcade versions and they are, you know, the arcade original arcade artwork. So there's the, uh, on the original one, the April O'Neil on the side. Dan will probably recognise it. Um, that's on the side of the quarter arcade. And that, that's the April O'Neil I recognise from, yeah, yeah, from yeah. back in the days. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, because I remember playing with, you know, back in the day, it was always, whenever I went to the seaside, you know, it was Simpsons Arcade or Turtles. Mm -hmm. You know, me and my brother spent hours on these games back then. One thing that I'm quite interested to see how well this plays is, because, I mean, I've got a few of these numbskull designs, quarter arcades. I've got, the, you know, the Pac-Man one, the Miss Pac-Man one. And my father-in-law, whenever he comes over, he says, oh, pass the Miss Pac-Man one, I'll have a go on that. He loves playing that. It's one of his favourite games. But, um... Obviously, Turtles was a four-player game, and these joysticks are very small. But looking at these images, it does look like there are four joysticks there on there. There is the four joysticks yeah. on there, and on the image of the person playing it, he's literally, like, holding the joystick with, like, <laughs> you know, like, kind of from above, like, with his hand. Yeah, two fingers. A little bit like yeah. a, yeah, with his fingers a little bit like a claw. And then he's, like, got one finger over both buttons. Um, so it is quite small. Maybe a little bit of a novelty, maybe. Because even back when, you know, yeah. when I was a kid around the arcade, getting four of you around a cabinet was quite tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Size, maybe, but... maybe we should buy one and get us three on one. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, they're, they're probably going to be collector's items, you know, with the uh, yeah. with the co-creators. And, I, and I'm assuming that they're, they're going to have maybe like a HDMI output or something that maybe you could just hook it up to a bigger monitor. Um, I'm not quite, Sometimes not they do. Sure. Yeah, I'm not sure on this I'm not one. Sure on this yeah, one, some of them they've do. got USB ports for the controllers on the front, but I've not seen any sort of HDMI out and no. stuff. Could be missing it. Um, but they have got um, a CRT kind of lens filter thing on here as well, which because um, that's one thing. I mean, generally when you play these, you remember them on a nice CRT. So looking at them on a small kind of you know like an iPad kind of screen sometimes ruins the vibe a little mm. bit. Mm. Um, but they've worked with. Konami on these and apparently they've got this new CRT lens technology that's going to make it look a lot more like the original display apparently oh nice I'll be interested to see that so um, yeah like like Joe said they're very limited edition so if you want to keep an eye on that I'll put that and everything else we talk about you find them all you don't have to google around I shove them all in our show notes at the retrohour.com now just a quick reminder that the reason we can bring you the retro hour every single Friday is thanks to the amazing community that surrounds our podcast. We've had a patron running for a couple of years now. Honestly, it's become not only an integral part as to how we can, you know, fund the show and pay for all our costs and keep it going, your equipment, server costs, audio hosting, audio editing software, all that kind of thing. Uh, but really, I think, you know, the, the main thing that we love about our patron is not the functional side of it. It is that community and the people that are now such a big part of the show and we love hanging out with them. I mean, we do monthly patrons hangouts, um, of which we just did one on Sunday. We are doing two this month. So if you'd like to come on and basically geek out with us, um, it'll be the last weekend of the month. We haven't quite decided what day yet, but obviously we'll keep you posted on that as we get nearer the time. But really, it's an excuse to come on, be part of the community. Uh, you know, you can get advice as well. That's often one thing I love about the patrons hangouts. You know, if anyone's got any problems or they want something identifying, you know, we had a guy in there a while back who, I found this random motherboard in, the, in, in a bin. Can anyone identify what this is? And then before the end of the call, everyone had identified it was like a, a 486 motherboard from 1993 or something. So it is an incredible community of people that we've got on there. And uh, if you'd like to join us for the next patrons hangout, you can sign up right now. And of course, uh, if you are a gold member or above, we don't just do this podcast, do we, Joe? No, we also do the After Hours podcast where we, you know, we kind of, I don't know, we, we chill out, kind of take our ties off, you know, kind of like undo, undo the top button of our shirts. Because <laughs> I'm wearing my tie every, every episode. Yeah, exactly. And but um, Ravi's in his tuxedo right now. <laughs> Absolutely. But no, the uh, the After Hours, we've done 35 episodes now. Um, we, we've done the, we've interviewed each other in the early episodes. We've done a kind of like retro years where we've discussed about highlights of particular years. We've done a lot of like our favorite consoles, our favorite games, our favorite um, games for particular consoles. But one that we've just done this last week, which was really fun, we played Mastermind against each other. Um, there it is, black chair spinning round. There it is. So um, yeah, I won't I won't spoil the results too much. But if you've been a fan of the Christmas quiz over the last what seven years, we've been doing this. <laughs> This episode uh, of Mastermind is definitely for you. A real, real yeah. funny one. And we had to write each other's questions. So me and Ravi having a pop at the questions was uh, some interesting <laughs> results, let's say. Let's I think my questions were the most obscure ones Oh, absolutely. Ones ever, absolutely, but, uh, Ravi. Now, little, little spoiler alert, Ravi wrote my questions. <laughs> yeah, just to, just to yeah. Add, add to the madness. Um, but yeah, <laughs> patrons just absolutely fantastic. And, you know, sometimes we have a patron on the show as well. And uh, I think it's about time we do that again um, yeah. because that's, that's really good fun as well. I love just the whole community and vibes around it. And at the moment, we're testing video for the After Hours podcast. So, dun, dun, dun. Uh, yeah, if you want to kind of see how that looks at the moment. It's my wife was watching the uh, this little uh, mastermind round that we did. She she heard some of Ravi's questions. She's like, what the? <laughs> <laughs> Look at this guy. What did he say? <laughs> so, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it's just just a great little community. Our patron, uh, our patrons hangouts, and uh, the, the extra stuff that you get, and also you get an ad free episode of the podcast. You get it early, you know, if I can get it out most weeks, and also you get an extra 10, 15 minutes of news that we just do for our patrons that we're about to do in just a moment, including talking about the world's smallest video game controller. So we're all of that right now on our Patreon. If you'd like to sign up, all the details to join us and be part of our community are at theretrohour.com. This quick reminder as well, um, if you're a fan of the podcast and you want a nice, easy way to help us out, because we appreciate not everyone could join us on Patreon, you know, but there is another way that you can do it that's completely free. So it'll only take up a couple of seconds of your time. If you enjoy what we do, um, give us a little rating on your podcast app of choice if it supports ratings and uh, a review on the Apple Podcast Store is always very valuable because a lot of other podcast clients actually get the podcast off Apple so um, us going higher in their charts gets a show in front of new people so a really simple way to help us out that will only take a couple of minutes of your time a little five star rating and a nice review makes the world of difference so a thank you to everyone who's recently left reviews and please do keep them coming and next we're going to be going inside the world of developing for the original the old school Atari 400 and 800 machines and bringing back this legendary game Montezuma's Revenge for 2023 with our special guest Rob Yeager he's next on the Retro Hour podcast You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time to welcome on this week's very special guest. And if you're a fan of 8-bit gaming, in particular the Atari home computer scene back in the day, you'll be very familiar with our guest this week. Well, I had the pleasure of hanging out with him in Poland at Pixel Heaven a couple of weeks ago. Let's welcome on our guest this week, best known for the classic Montezuma's Revenge, Rob Yeager. How's it going, Rob? Uh, it's going well. Thanks a lot, Dan. Thanks for having me on the Retro Hour it was great meeting you in Poland too. The uh, Pixel Heaven was uh, was a lot of fun. Yeah, because I mean that was my second time at that event, but that was your first time. Was it your first time in Poland, wasn't it altogether? It, yes, it was my first time invited out there. First time in Poland, and and for me, uh, you know, Poland means a lot. I, I really, it's the it's the Polish, uh, the Polish Atari uh, community has really uh, you know kept kept the the Atari computers alive with uh, with you know they've been coming out with new games you know ever since the 80s uh, mm. uh, in Poland so uh, the computer you see in in Poland the Atari computers were uh, they were like the main computers for I, I believe like 15 20 years possibly I mean because of the political situation there so people remember my game and, and it was very uh, it was very flattering uh, you know, at, at the show in Poland to have, uh, you know, people come up to me and say, uh, just to say that my game was, was uh, their childhood. Yeah, it was quite surreal because I was watching your talk on stage and I was doing a bit of, you know, looking on my phone and a lot of the pages that came up were actually in Polish. So I was like, it's interesting how that game became so big, you know, so many miles away. But I guess that makes sense if, if the Atari scene was so big out there. Yeah, well, it's really the, uh, the community in Poland and also in mm. Chile. So it's these two countries that have really kept the Atari alive, but also retro gaming in general. Uh, these two countries are, are, are really, really strong. Tremendous fans. In fact, most of the people that that I hear from are either from, as far as fan mail that I still get, it's normally either from Poland or Chile. Very grateful for, for, for these fans. Well, it's going to be interesting to hear something, you know, the stories about your development history as well and how, what kind of went into making the game. But I mean, just to kind of wind it back to day one for a bit of context, what originally got you interested in computers and gaming? What are kind of your earliest memories that you've got there? Okay, I've always been an arcade kid. And I'm very lucky to be of that, that age, that, that sweet spot in history where I was able to witness the entire evolution of uh, computer gaming. Uh, so I, I, I remember playing the first time I played pinball. I was about four years old, standing on a crate, and I fell in love with the game. I just fell in love with pinball and arcades. And at that point in time, in the early 70s, arcades were pinball machines. But then in 1972, Pong came out as the first video game, the first video game to be popular and the first good video game. And I just completely was in awe of Pong and all of the early uh, black and white uh, video games uh, go, you know, from gunfight to breakout. And I knew uh, when I was seven, eight years old that I, I wanted to be a video game developer. Uh, and I wanted to work for Atari. That, I mean, that was the the, the ultimate goal. So, uh, so you know, I, I was incredibly uh, fortunate to see this whole uh, evolution of games happen. And uh, 
I was also very fortunate to, to have parents to, that were supportive of me. And uh, when I was about 10 years old, uh, my father uh, got me a Bally Astrocade which was the console that I wanted because it had the best basic uh, cartridge. It had the best, it had the best ability to create games at home. Um, at the time, the Astrocade wasn't a very popular system. It was the Atari VCS, which was really number one. And they also had a basic cartridge, but it was super primitive. It, as you can imagine, I mean, you guys know that the Atari 2600 is uh, you know, technically sticks and stones. Mm. Well, uh, you, you mentioned there you were like programming, and uh, what, what did you initially start creating? And were you like taking stuff out of magazines and then uh, kind of copying it? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean that's what we all did uh, back then. There was Compute Magazine uh, for the Atari. There was Antic and Analog, and that that really was how I learned. How most people learned how to code, uh, you know, by by typing out of the magazines and modifying games for magazines. But I, I wasted no time. I, I was, uh, I guess, about 10 years old when I, when I started programming and programming in BASIC uh, on the Asteroid Kid. And I, I wrote a bunch of uh, arcade clones that were in BASIC. But one of the really nifty things about the, uh, the Asteroid Kid is that it allowed machine language subroutines in BASIC. So you were able to, to spice up your basic programs with, uh, subroutines that are in machine language. So you were able to put all the graphics motion into these subroutines and have, you know, the, the, the basic computation stuff done in basic and it got pretty good results. So I, I recall I, I made a, uh, I made a, a clone of a missile command. And a, and a few other arcade games of the time, but they, they, they were in basic and, and they never got, uh, they never got published, but they did get released onto the, you know, out, out into the community, into the, uh, you know, in, into, into the, what, what predated the internet, you know, the, the BBS systems that were, that were mm -hmm. used at the time to, to, uh, to trade software. I was wondering, did you um, then have any friends that were also doing this? And uh, did you do any at school as well? Any programming? Well, you know, it was an interesting time. I am self-taught in computer science. But at the time when I was programming games, th there were very few books um, on assembly language. So I, I recall there were no books at all uh, that I was able to acquire on 6502. Uh, there was only... Uh, you know, the reference manuals from, uh, you know, from the manufacturer. So in technical manuals. So, so you, at the time, I mean, most people learned this way through technical manuals and, you know, uh, through uh, little pieces of code that you could find here and there, but there were very few books that actually taught the subject. So I, I, I remember uh, there was one book uh, called the Z80 cookbook, which was mm. one of the very, very few uh, assembly language books that actually had nice, like, you know, sample code, but it was for Z80, not for 6502. But the, you know, the basic concepts apply across the board for, you know, 8-bit uh, programming. So I learned a lot uh, from what was available for Z80 because there just was very little available for 6502 uh, back in like 1978. So, so I, bas I basically learned uh, computer science uh, on my own, and it was really, you know, it was it, it all gets down to that that strong desire and that strong interest, and and just being, you know, consumed uh, by it. And I also had a strong background in art. I mean, my my background is definitely more art than science. And um, uh, and and as far as uh, school, I I never was I, I didn't excel in in subjects outside of computer science. So the schools that were teaching uh, the, these types of advanced uh, things were were schools that I I, I really w w I was not able to get into uh, because my my grades my my high school grades weren't strong enough. Uh, so I was left to to learn it on my own, but I started my own company uh, when I was about fourteen, and uh, I sold a, a game called Pinhead, which was a uh, a clone of the. Uh, it wasn't a clone; it was derivative uh, of the game Kickman, the arcade game Kickman.
That's quite interesting, that journey there then, because, I mean, yeah, you started programming yourself on your Astrocade, and then Utopia Software was the company that you set up. And That's correct. Tell us, how did you go from just kind of making games for yourself then to actually wanting to release these under a, a company kind of brand? How did that work? Well, my first commercial game was called Chomper, and it was a very derivative uh, Pac-Man type, type game. And I licensed that uh, to a tiny little publisher that was that was local. And I mean, at the time, he, he, a lot of there were a lot of mom and pop uh, publishers. And I, I just figured for, for my next game, I, I would do it on my own and just set up my own company. And I was planning on selling Montezuma's Revenge through Utopia Software. So uh, we uh, we sold Pinhead on diskette and cassette. And uh, we did everything and just, you know, kind of had a little video game manufacturing warehouse in the garage. And, uh, you know, the game, it it didn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't a hit, but it, it, it it was profitable uh, at that, at that, at the time. Uh, But what happened with Montezuma, uh, my my father was able to uh, get a, a booth, secure a booth or half a booth at the Consumer Electronics Show. The Consumer Electronics Show is the show that predates E3. Mm. Uh, so at the time, video games and software didn't have their own show. They just had a uh, they had a hall in the Consumer Electronics Show. So we uh, were very fortunate to be able to get a just any spot at that show. And but the thing was. Uh, we weren't set up in the video game area. We didn't know where we were going to be set up. We shared a booth with a blank videotape company. Now, the blank videotape company wound up having a phenomenal space at the show, which was just at the entrance of the X-rated video area. Okay. Right. Now, you must, you know, you have to realize this is going back in, this is 1980, 1983. This was the biggest part of the show. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the cassette, the X-rated video cassette, the stars, the porn stars at the time were celebrity. I mean, this is, they, to, they were, they were household names at the time and they were all there. So every person who came to the show wound up going through this hall because everyone wanted to go to this part and everyone saw Montezuma's Revenge and Pinhead uh, being being displayed. So uh, while we were displaying it, the Parker Brothers guys came over. Uh, we saw you know Parker Brothers badges, and we're like, oh, it looks like Parker Brothers is is interested in Montezuma. And sure enough, they uh, before the show was over, they they wound up taking myself and my father uh, out to dinner and and just discussing the possibility of of. Parker uh, doing worldwide distribution of Montezuma, which they, you know, which we they eventually uh, got, and uh, and and that was history. Mm. It, it must have been um, interesting having such a, a kind of supportive father um, doing that. You know, not many people at that age would have had uh, that support and that kind of help and uh, you know foresight as well to go to these shows. Yeah, I'm. I'm very fortunate. Uh, my father's still uh, supportive. In fact, it, we're going to be celebrating his his eighty uh, seventh birthday tomorrow. So yeah, my, my family have, have have been very supportive. But but they saw they saw what I was doing on these computers, and 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 a, a lot of people noticed that uh, that 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 I was just naturally good at this, and uh, it, it was a, you, you know at the time it was a very good business uh you know it was it was a profitable business as far as you know, selling software for thirty dollars that only cost a, a few dollars to make at the time so um I, I was wondering uh where where did the idea and the kind of concept of uh, montezuma's revenge come from well i i credit my friend uh, mark sunshine for the concept because the the story is i uh, i created uh, a little man a little animated man and i i wanted to create a a uh, an original game because the previous games that I did were, were very derivative from arcade pieces. And I was just my, my friend where my friend was there in my bedroom and we were just playing with the computer and I was telling him this and he just said, create a game called call and call it Montezuma's revenge and, and give it a, you know, a central American theme with the pyramid and Montezuma's revenge. Uh, people 
back then everyone knew it was the slang term for like the uh, like the bacterial infection people would get from drinking the water in mexico Mm. So it was a joke. I mean, it's diarrhea, basically. It's like, that's what Montezuma's Revenge is. But people, a lot of people, uh, my game has kind of taken a little paragraph into pop culture. So people, a lot of people, when they hear Montezuma's Revenge now, they don't even know that it was based on a, a, a popular expression of the time. They just think that's the name of the game. Yeah, I asked you that in Poland. What, what does that mean? I thought that's quite an interesting. Uh, it stands out that name. Then you explained it to me. I was like, ah, okay. and, and also uh, the the character <laughs> being uh, Panama Joe, uh, otherwise known as Pedro, as well. Well, there's a story behind that. Uh, um, what, I was originally creating Montezuma's Revenge for a loaded Atari computer. I wanted to show off what an Atari computer can do, and a loaded Atari computer of that day had 48k ram ram was very expensive back then and a floppy disk drive and the disk drive cost as much as as the computer back then uh so very few people had this loaded system so parker brothers uh they just went ahead and said listen we're going to make this game a cartridge we're not going to make it a disc uh we we get it, we need it to fit into either an 8 or a 6 a 16k system which were the popular systems of the time so they basically said to me, you know, you don't have to finish the game. Uh, we're going to reduce the game. And they made a couple other changes, including changing the name of the character from Pedro to uh, to Panama. Originally, Panama Jack, they realized that Panama Jack was a suntan lotion company. And then it went over to Panama Joe. Uh, and they also changed the graphics a little bit. They changed the hat. They made the hat uh, less of a sombrero, more a... Uh, uh, more of an Indiana Jones type thing. I feel that Parker, the artwork on the box and everything, they they were capitalizing a bit on the on the whole Indiana Jones uh, thing. And uh, I, I don't. I'm I'm very quick to say you know what it, I'm very quick to admit what has influenced Montezuma. But Indiana Jones really was not an influence of uh, of Montezuma's Revenge. Well, I know the game was it was really an early example of a, you know what we call a Metroid Metroidvania kind of genre game today. I mean, were there any like games or media that influenced its its design and gameplay when you were in that early design? Phase? Yeah, oh, oh, the Metroidvania series that is, I mean, to to me after uh, the video game crash in the mid eighties, I kind of went away. I, I left the video game business, and I, and I would say that the Metro uh, these Metroid games are are something of the uh, uh, the logical uh, successor of the genre from Montezuma. Mm. Um, the games that influence Montezuma are some games that were not really uh, like, okay, for example, Atari Superman on the 2600. That's an influence of Montezuma because that had that, you know, nonlinear open uh, play area where the actual, you know, the actual, play field was multiple screens not you weren't limited to one you know one individual screen you you, you the, the world existed outside of the current uh, the current view uh so i i credit atari superman and of course uh you always when if you're moving a man on a screen and you're climbing ladders you you, you have to mention mario uh donkey mm. donkey kong uh was a, an arcade game before uh Montezuma's revenge uh, so th- those those two games, I would say, were the main uh, the main influences of of Montezuma. Um, but also, uh, Montezuma was very influenced by coin operated games. I really wanted to kind of merge uh, coin op and computer uh, games. And at the time, computer games really weren't even well defined, but uh, coin op games certainly were. Uh, so uh, my game. Had had a very uh, the original version of my game had a, had a very elaborate attract mode, so when the game wasn't in play, it was kind of like watching a little cartoon of the uh, you know the game, which very few games had at the time, but all coin operated games had that. Well, the the, the game structure was uh, very innovative at the time. Um, how did you go about like designing the levels? Well, I, I was very limited uh, with the the amount of. Uh, even though I had the 48K, uh, I still had to conserve space. So in the original Montezuma, I believe there was only uh, probably 
maybe less than 10 fully unique rooms. So I employed techniques like mirroring and adding walls, subtracting things just to kind of make variations of the room because just because memory was, 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 was so in, in, incredibly tight at the time. It's, uh, it's been a while. So, you know, I, I, I don't recall all uh, that I had to do, but uh, assembly language programming is very, very difficult and, and you really have to, uh, everything is get, gets down to tricks and, 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 and uh, doing things that we don't have to think about anymore in coding. Uh, well, you know, the the game had um, different difficulty levels as well. Nine of them, I believe, um, with various changes to the game's environments. So what was the idea behind having these different skill levels for different players? Then, well, that that was um, okay. So it's, there's nine. Th- there's really nine variations to the same pyramid. So you can start on a more difficult pyramid and, and, uh, and the higher levels need to be unlocked. So you need to, you know, get past level three to play level four. Um, so, um, it, it, it's basically kind of like a scripting language that adds, uh, enemies based enemies and walls and keys and doors. Like, like it's the same, it's the same background of the pyramid, but the gameplay is very different. Uh, like for example, uh, on level one, most of the right side of the pyramid is closed off. You, you can't even get there. So you're kind of limited level two. It's the left side that's closed off. And for the rest of the levels, the it's in, entirely opened up. Uh, but each level is, has, has more difficulty, more enemies, uh, more difficult door key challenges and also the uh, darkness was a feature of the game so in the first level the lower okay so the pyramid itself had nine layers yeah so you can you, you can picture and i believe the bottommost layer had 18 rooms and then 16 rooms then 14 rooms all the way up to the top one with three rooms so in level one the lower most row is in the dark and you need to find a torch in order to play those rooms in lit up normally. The second level is the bottom two uh, rooms are dark and, you know, third level, the bottom three uh, levels are in the dark. So finding the torch is a key element of the game. One thing I, I definitely want to mention, uh, I mean, this is a game that's 40 years old. After the crash, the video game crash, which was really devastating for me and really everyone who was, you know, who was successful in that early wave of, uh, of computer games, I left uh, the whole computer games world for a bit. And, and I worked in financial te- uh, technology uh, in New York City for a while. Uh, and I eventually did come back to games. And, and about 10 years ago, I brought a Montezuma back and I created versions of Montezuma uh, for the mobile systems and eventually for Steam. And, and right now it is available for most, uh, on, on most of your game stores. Uh, and it's just, uh, and it's going to be available for a lot more uh, as we're going forward. But what uh, the project that I'm working on now uh, that I spoke about at Pixel Heaven uh, is w- what I'm calling Montezuma's Revenge Director's Cut. Uh, I mentioned before that Parker Brothers, back in 1983, Parker Brothers told me to never, you know, that I don't need to finish the game. And now at that point, I had it, you know, I had an advance from them. Uh, I was 16 years old and that's all I need to hear. I don't have to finish it. You know, you can have, you don't have to do anything else and just spend the money. I'm like, okay, that's great. Uh, I never thought that in 40 years later, I'd still be talking about this game, that I'd be invited to a conference to, to talk about it. And, and I just see that there's a lot of love for Montezuma uh, in, in the uh, retro game community. So I just decided to finish the game, to finish what I was doing when I was 16 years old, uh, but make it even better because, uh, mm. I mean, obviously a, a game now is not going to be sold on a, on a, on a diskette. But now we have for the Atari, we have 256K cartridges. We have, you know, bank switching uh, cartridges that could hold 256K. So instead of 77K that I had on disc, now I got 256K. So that is my, my current uh, project is finishing, uh, finishing Montezuma. And it looks like uh, we're aiming for December of this year. Well, um, um, uh, we'll, we'll get into that a bit later because that sounds really really exciting that you're, you're kind of revisiting it. I just uh, wanted to know about the original one as well. Um, 
on the original one, there was an unfinished boss fight at the end with uh, King Montezuma. And, and what was the story there? Why was it finished? Yeah, well, that was the thing. In the original vision, uh, this whole adventure, you know, culminated in a in a in a, in a fight in a, a boss. Uh, the 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 um, the okay. So what happened was my original version of the game, my incomplete version, got leaked. Uh, it got leaked before the game, uh, the official version of the game, was released. So my big version of Montezuma, which had an incomplete boss, um was leaked all over the world. And it's really the version of the game that the Atari people love the most because it has, it has the bat. It has, it has burning ropes and has features that all these different features that were removed from the Parker brothers version. However, you have to imagine what happened. I mean, everyone, uh, this game was leaked and it was, you know, it was a really hot game on the, on the, on the, on the pirate boards. Uh, but then everyone realized there's no ending. You can't beat the boss. I never, I, I didn't get that far. So it has a boss that you simply cannot beat. The boss is always going to beat you. And, and you really, you had no way to strike the boss either. So the boss just simply stomped his foot. And when he stomped his foot, the ground shook and you fell off the platform you were standing on. Uh, so the only, the only move you had against the boss was a defensive move, was to jump and to be in the air when he stomps his foot on the ground. And that element of gameplay is still in, you know, what I'm working on now in, 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 in the, uh, the, the completed version. But yeah, so there's two versions of Montezuma the, in, the, in the Atari universe. Uh, the one that I mistakenly called the preliminary version is the Parker Brothers version. The community thought that the big version of Montezuma was going to be like a, you know, a full release. You know, they thought that the that the small version was the preliminary version and that the bigger mm. version was really the main version. So to me, because that was, you know, the, the big version was the one that escaped first. I, I in my mind, I, I, I refer to it as the preliminary version, but the community knows the Parker version as the prelim version uh, simply because they thought the bigger version was was going to be the game that was going to be the eventual full game. And it is. But it just took 40 years. I'm quite interested to hear more about Parker Brothers video games division as well, because I mean, obviously we know them for, you know, Cluedo and Monopoly and Scrabble yep. and, you know, these really big, well-known board games. But how kind of big was their video games division then? And um, did it last very long or did they kind of move away when the crash happened? They were big. Parker was a big force in the video game industry back then. Uh, but you're right. Uh, Montezuma's Revenge was the only fully original title that Parker Brothers ever released. Parker had licenses. So they had famous licenses. So they had uh, a lot of arcade games. They had Frogger. Uh, so they, they licensed a, a, a few good ar arcade games, but they also licensed movies uh, like uh, James Bond. Uh, uh, they, so they, they licensed known products. So Montezuma was their biggest risk. And, and, and you know, f as far as them trying something a little different. And uh, Montezuma was a hit, so you know they they they, they sort of, Parker Brothers certainly did did well with it. Um, but at the time, P Parker was a very very well respected uh, publisher. Uh, they didn't really do in uh, to the best of my knowledge, they didn't do in house developing. Uh, mm -hmm. They hired developers that were starting to splinter off from the major companies at that time. So like, like much in the way that the Activision splintered off from Atari and, and they just kind of created their own thing. There were other smaller uh, development companies where groups from well-known uh, large companies kind of broke off and did their own little development companies. So the, I, I, I didn't, uh, I had very little communication, very little need actually. They took my source code, they took my 6502 source code and, uh, you know, reduced it and ported it, uh, had really good guys. I mean, good, good developers ported to all these various systems. And the game was, you know, pretty much a hit across the board. Uh, they, they did it. They did a very nice job. The Commodore 64 version is very good. Uh, even the app, the Apple II version is very, very nice. And, you know, on that system, you don't have sprites. You don't, you, you don't have any, any sophisticated, uh, graphics chip there. And even the, uh, 
Atari VCS, the Atari 2600 version. They were limited to, I think, like nine rooms on that version. But for a 2600 game, it, it's a good game, you know, for, for an, open, uh, an open game. The soundtrack of the game is quite a unique aspect. You know, you had chip, chip tune versions of a... Uh, Mexican folk songs. Why? Why did you choose to incorporate those in the games? Was it uh, due to copyright? Well, you, you say the eventual game that was released through Parker Brothers had no music at all, uh, and it was very. It was common for games to not have uh, any kind of background music. I did. I did write a nice music engine for the big version of Montezuma. And it's released, you know, I never intended for that version of the game to ever, you know, get out into the wild. Uh, so the song, the music in that game is not mine. Uh, and I never, I mean, it was just filler music to, to demonstrate the audio engine. So the song is Spanish Flea by Herb Alpert. So I, I would have never, ever, you know, left that there uh, if I, you know, had any idea that this was going to escape into the wild. Uh, so that that's the music. And in the game itself, when you pick up a key or really any, when you, when you pick up anything, it plays La Cucaracha, La Cucaracha, which is a little, da, 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 which is a little something everyone knows. It's uh, traditional, so you don't have to worry about any, you know, anyone making any kind of claim to it. And, uh, and it's just an expression of joy in, in my mind, uh, in my, my thinking at the time. So as far as music, Montezuma was definitely weak on music. However, the uh, the version that we released last year, last year we we released a version for the Nintendo Entertainment System, and that version does have a full, have a full uh, backing soundtrack. And that music, uh, which is really a really good song, is going to be incorporated into uh, in, into all the versions in the next release. Well, Electronic Games Monthly, um, massive magazine back then, they featured Montezuma's Revenge as their Game of the Month in 1984. So how did that feel when you saw that? That Okay, I would say, and, and, I, and I, I have to correct you a little bit, because it's at the time it was Electronic Games Magazine. Electronic Games right, Monthly yeah, yeah. came out later, uh, and it was a different group. But Electronic Games Magazine at the time, was the greatest video games magazine. Uh, that was on top of the world. Uh, that was Arnie Katz and Bill Kunkel. Bill Kunkel used to write for Marvel Comics. Uh, these guys were the pulse of the, of the video game industry. And when I was a kid, I was very shy, very, very reclusive, and I did not give interviews. I just simply, uh, at the time, a lot of people came to me and I just didn't care. I didn't care about publicity, I didn't care about interviews. I just wanted to work on code. But uh, Electronic Games Magazine is such an honor that I was very willing to meet with them and talk to them and, and give them, you know, uh, as, uh, all of my time. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was, uh, I, I believe it was, it was December, December 84, was, I believe it was. Uh, a terrific game of the month. Uh, written by Bill Kunkel, who's probably the greatest journalist in video games. And, you know, to be in the December issue, it, 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 everything was perfect uh, about that. And and that really, that, I, I have to say, we're talking about, you know, 40 years ago, uh, uh, that particular interview was probably my high point of my video game career, right, right there. Uh, until appearing on the Retro Hour, of Until course. appearing here, yes. <laughs> that was my, yes. My Electronic Games Magazine article was my second second most important thing that I had to do. <laughs> I'm only teasing, Rob, of course. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, did that really help sales after you were in uh, that December issue? Then, because that must have put it in front of a lot of fans. Okay, well, I mean, Parker Brothers, they, they were a big advertiser, too, of, uh, in Electronic Games Magazine. And I'm sure that influence had a lot to do with getting Montezuma as Game of the Month for December. So in addition to uh, being Game of the Month, they, they also had the back cover. I believe, no, they had the inside cover of Electronic Games. They had the back cover of Marvel Comics for three months. Uh, so they, they did a terrific job of getting, of getting it out there. And, and yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, they, the, the marketing team at Parker Brothers, they, they knew, it, so they knew what they were doing and they, they did a terrific job of just, uh, coordinating the Electronic Games magazine with the, uh, 
with the Marvel Comics ad, and it, 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 Montezuma was everywhere for a brief period, uh, for like a three-month period at the time of the launch. Well, after Montezuma's Revenge, um, did you work on a, an unreleased game called Crossfire Canyon? I kind of saw that in my research. What, what kind of happened there? Yeah, Crossfire Canyon, uh, okay, that that represents my 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 wake-up period, I guess you could say. that That's when I fully understood how how bad the crash was, how bad the video game crash was. Uh, Crossfire Canyon is a fun game. And it was originally written on the VIC-20 by a friend of mine, uh, Dave Sullivan, a neighbor friend. Uh, I really loved the game. And I ported his game to the Commodore 64. And I added you know, a lot of animation, a lot of graphics. But it, but it wasn't my, uh, my original game. However, it, it was for the time, we're talking about 1985, 1986, uh, it was a retro game for that period, uh, mm. if you can imagine. It was very, very simple because at that point, games were, were starting, you know, in our, the way we see things now, games were going downhill. They were becoming more, at that point, I think we already had, we had the CD player arrived and, and, and missed and, you know, games were becoming graphical uh, monstrosities rather than fun games. Um, so, so Crossfire Canyon was just a simple, simple, fun game. Now, back when I was dealing with Parker Brothers with Montezuma's Revenge, they would, they actually sent a, uh, they would send a limousine and, and, you know, from the, so the airport, they pick us up in a limousine and with them and everything was just like, I was treated like a rock star. And when it was time for Crossfire Canyon, it was like, well, we don't do that anymore. The budget is cut down to nothing. If you want to come, you know, you're going to have to do it on your own dime. And Parker Brothers was not interested in in Crossfire Canyon. Uh, it was difficult to, to get that to market because at the time, uh, people were afraid to market games. I mean, it was, it was a disaster uh, for the industry. So Crossfire Canyon was really kind of the reason why I left games for a while. Uh, going from Montezuma, going from the top of the world to, you know, going to having a difficult time even getting a meeting. Uh, it, it was, it was kind of devastating. You know, it, it was a pain, it was a painful time, but I did get back into the video games business, uh, I guess about six or seven years later. Are there any copies of uh, Cross, Crossfire Canyon out there then? Is there yeah, you know, I, I, I recently came across it and uh, apparently a small, publisher did market it now i don't even remember but i know this i know i did a deal with them for montezuma so i'm, I'm i i it, it was marketed it was never successful it never had any strong marketing it didn't it never had worldwide uh marketing so it's it's a very obscure game but but it's a fun game though it, and, it, and it had really nice animation and it's a shame that it never uh that it was just at the wrong time it was just a terrible time to try to market a game uh, well, back then in, in the late 90s, uh, Montezuma's Return was released for the PC, but also the Game Boy Color. Were you involved with that? And what what did you think of, um, you know, having it on a portable system as well? Well, uh, I, I have to tell you, the, the, the Game Boy version is, uh, at the time, this, uh, this was my second video game company. This was Utopia Technologies. And at the time that we did the deal for that, uh, it was a very chaotic time in my life. And uh, we were basically going through a very rough corporate breakup. And I never gave my approval for that particular version of Montezuma. And it, it always bothered me that it was basically done, that it, most likely someone gave misinformation that I approved it. Uh, mm. I, I just give you an idea how how things were at the time uh so i really don't I, I i don't know much about that that particular version but montezuma's return uh was a, certainly not a successful game it was a flop uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's a flop we didn't lose money on it as far as a, 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 a game goes but uh it wasn't a hit but it was a technical marvel. Uh, it was one of the first uh, full six degrees of freedom 3D games. Uh, the game would have been uh, a tremendous. Uh, well, I'm not necessarily hit, but it would have it would have gotten an unbelievable amount of media attention if Quake didn't come out a month before. 
Um, mm. So we were working on, a, on a, an amazing 3D engine, but it wasn't Quake. I mean, it wasn't as good as Quake. Quake was just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, but ours, our, our game, our, our engine was was phenomenal in a different way, uh, in the in the sense that it was it wasn't limited the way Quake was. Quake did have restrictions, and we're doing tricks on on to, to get their 3D going that quickly. Uh, so we were doing uh, more of a pure uh, six degree of freedom, and and we had effects that Quake didn't have, like chrome mapping and water effects uh, that were really really cool. Uh, but the game itself was a first person game that was not a shooter. It was a game that was about puzzle solving. It was, it was more about jumping challenges and, and, and puzzle solving challenges in the spirit of the original Montezuma's Revenge. Uh, but, uh, in general, at the time, certainly at that time, people wanted shooters. People, people wanted a, really wanted to shoot a gun when they were in that first person environment. We'll bring it a bit more, you know, into the modern day then. And obviously we'll talk about your, uh, you know, the new updated versions of Montezuma's Revenge are coming out um, for, for all platforms soon. But tell me about the, the NES port then, because that was quite interesting. So you partnered with Second Dimension. Why did you want to bring it out for, for such a retro system? And was it kind of a, j- just the fact that, you know, you didn't have a chance to do it on the NES back in the day? T- tell us a bit more about the decision to bring it to that platform. Yeah, well, it was a pretty easy decision um, because a, a, a programmer, a, a real wizard, programmer came to me with more or less a completed version of the game and uh, his name is uh, Philippe Renaud he's a terrific uh, amazing uh, Nintendo programmer and he basically said you know I I, I, I want to uh, 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 the game okay the story behind this is that the Montezuma's Revenge was never released for the Nintendo and the the reason I'm, I assume that it was never released, is I, I believe Parker had a deal with Sega at the time. So Parker Brothers uh, re-released Montezuma for the Sega Master System. And the Sega Master System of, of Montezuma's Revenge is a really good version of the game. Uh, it's different. It's, a, it's, a, it's more advanced than the others. And uh, it was a really good Sega Master System game. But uh, at the time, before... The Nintendo Entertainment System was released. Uh, the it was kind of like Sega was releasing the Master System. Nintendo was released in the NES. Uh, now the Famicom was really popular in Japan, and 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 everyone knew Nintendo had a lot of money to invest behind uh, their system. But from a technical point of view, as a programmer and a game designer, that Sega Master System was magnificent. I mean, it was, yeah. it had hardware. It, it, you had, I mean, we're talking about better than arcade quality games on that thing at the time. And that wasn't true for Nintendo. Nintendo was pretty basic um, as, as, as far as, uh, you know, its graphical uh, abilities. But, you know, history is history. And Nintendo became the big, big system. And I, I, I just, I kind of, you know, because I left the business for a while, I just neglected ever having a Nintendo version made. So when Philippe came to me with the completed version, uh, I was just thrilled, uh, you know, to, uh, to do something with it. So last year we, uh, we, we did a Kickstarter, a successful Kickstarter for it. I teamed up with Second Dimension, uh, because they, they, they have experience in, in actually producing cartridges and, you know, doing the manufacturing. Um, and also, uh, Adam Welch from, uh, from Second Dimension, he was the, uh, the production manager. So he served as a consultant for the whole Kickstarter process too, because all, all of that was, was new to me. So that, that was our big thing last year. Now the, um, the, the, we put the game out on, on cartridge and we did, we have a limited edition where only a hundred were made. A limited edition was a box that has the cartridge in it and a hat, posters. Uh, I have a little flash drive made up with the character Pedro. Uh, so the limited edition is a whole, it's all, it's a whole grab bag of goodies, uh, Montezuma goodies and, uh, and including a certificate. Only 100 were made. And the, uh, the main version of the game, uh, uh, did well for, for, for a retro game. Uh, but certainly, uh, 
boy, I really, I really do regret uh, not having Montezuma out for the original Nintendo at the time because it would have been a great, uh, a great Nintendo game. I mean, it, it is right now uh, a great Nintendo game. We produced uh, Philip Ray actually programmed it within the restrictions of the the original Nintendo cartridges of the time. So yeah. it's a very much the version of Montezuma that wasn't released. I mean, it's exactly the way it would have been uh, as as a nineteen you know eighty five release, early release I mean, I mean, for Nintendo. Were you paying attention to this kind of retro scene at the time then? Were you surprised that they were still making physical games for the NES and there was still a market there? No, I mean, I knew that there were companies out there uh, that, were, that were specializing on it. There seemed to be an, like a reemergence. They, they, over the last few years, it does seem like, you know, companies have kind of jumped in and, 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 and uh, we saw the Activision guys with their Circus Convoy. Uh, yeah. We see we see lots of companies that are kind of taking a stab at that retro cartridges now, but it, it's not a I mean, it, it's not a great business. Uh, it, it's just there's just not enough. I mean, it's just not enough. There are not enough people out there that are still playing these games. They're very loyal. They're very dedicated. Uh, but it's just not uh, it, it's just not big numbers. Uh uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you are, you are going to be addressing that. And obviously, like we mentioned, uh, we, we touched upon earlier, a lot more people are going to get a chance to play a new version of Montezuma's Revenge as well. So this is going to be a version that's released on all modern platforms and kind of give us a lowdown here and tell us about what, what we can expect from this. Right. OK, so there's there's two games being developed right now. Montezuma's Director's Cut, which is the one that I've been talking about. This one is 40 years in the making. This is this is the completed version, my completed vision with the bosses, with much more complex rooms, much 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 more mission oriented. Uh, it's it just it's just more of an adventure, much much more of, more of a game. Uh, last year, I, I signed a deal to finally get Montezuma to the consoles. This is something that I really wanted to to do for a while. Um, and I, I, I finally uh, got a, a, a publisher. It's a the, the publisher is is a, a, a new publisher, but the the people involved have been involved in the games industry since the old days. Uh, and the uh, the company that's actually uh, doing the development is a Mission Critical Studios, and they they, they have a, a a a good history in creating. Uh, uh, Switch games and uh, you know games for all of the uh, the the major uh, consoles and also uh, uh, Steam. Uh, we're, we're gonna the the console version is the, the working title is the 40th anniversary anniversary edition, and mm -hmm. uh, it's gonna be a Montezuma game that's gonna be um, far beyond you know anything that I'm doing right now. I'm I'm coding within the restrictions of the Atari 800. So the work that I'm doing is very much a retro game, and we absolutely plan on getting this out as an Atari cartridge. Uh, but it's first going to be released to the masses, uh, most likely on Steam. But it's still going to be an Atari-style game. Uh, so, but the but the um, we the current plan is to get the director's cut and also the classic version of Montezuma's Revenge included in the 40th anniversary. So when you buy that console version, you're going to get all the current Montezumas. Uh, so you'll you'll have the the fully enhanced 40th anniversary with you know tons of enhancements for the console, and uh, you'll have the director's cut and also the tradition the standard version, which is currently being marketed, which is uh, similar to the Parker Brothers release. That sounds incredible. I mean, for you personally, being able to do this director's cut version then and kind of you know, realizing that vision that you had 40 years ago, that must feel pretty special to be able to do that now. Yeah, I'm, 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 ama I'm flattered. I'm honored. I never, in, in a, a million years, I, I never thought when I was 16 years old writing Montezuma that, that, that I would be a 56-year-old man talking about how it, it, it's still my career is, is creating Montezuma games. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, it's amazing. I, I never ever thought so, that it was, you know, I, I figured at the time, uh, uh, people were saying that the video games were a fad, you know, this is a fad, you know, this is the latest thing. And then when the video game crashed, it was like, oh, maybe they were right. You know, maybe this is a fad and it's over now. Uh, 
But no, I I, I, I was wrong. And uh, <laughs> video, video games were here to stay. But it, it is true that something happened uh, you know, around, I, I guess, you know, in, in, in the, the, the mid 80s, around the time of the video game crash, it kind of marked the end of the retro period of video games. You know, what we call the retro mm. period now the fun games. I mean, a few games came out in the 90s that were popular and of the style, and I would include Tetris in that, and Tetris is really the main one that comes to mind. Uh, But in general, (coughs) games went downhill because uh, the developers were focused too much on the high-resolution graphics. It's almost like we got ahead of ourselves. We we got... uh, The graphics got into too high-resolution before we were able to like we we compromised the 60 frames a second which mm. which was a terrible compromise it, it, the 60 frames a second is really essential for the interaction to lose yourself in the fun of the game and games became more like movies than games you know something you watch more than you play and the fun element kind of got diminished in, in my opinion uh, that probably explains the resurgence of retro gaming then, you know. That, what, that's so that's, that's how I feel about it. Yeah, I feel like yeah. a lot of people feel the way I do. Where, I, uh, Like, I left games, but it's almost like games stopped being fun. You know, it's almost like I, I, I felt like, was I maturing and games just stopped being fun for me? But then I'm like, no, I still like playing Pac-Man. I still mm. like playing Asteroids. To this day, I still like playing Pac-Man. I like playing Asteroids. Uh, like these games are timeless and they have endless replay value and they're easy to learn. You don't have to study anything to learn how to play the game. But, you know, they had these things in common uh, that just made them classic and, and great. Yeah, and it does prove that a great game design, you know, has got longevity and the fact that now, 40 years later, you know, we've got this massive, the worldwide internet distribution now, you can connect with fans all over the world, you're getting flown out to international conferences to talk about it as well. I mean, you know, when the game comes out again, I mean, you've got a much bigger potential audience than you ever did back in the day, so it really proves that, you know, it's uh, the longevity of Montezuma's Revenge. And uh, when can people get hold of it then? Is there any kind of timeline for when you're expecting this to be released? Well... For the director's cut, I'm looking at December. Uh, so December is definitely a doable release date. As far as, and we're kind of hoping around the same period for the console version too. Uh, so basically next year should be a really good year for Montezuma games. But I do want to you know stress to the audience that you can buy Montezuma right now. It's only $3.00. In, in, in the stores, you get on the mobile systems and the and Steam and Windows Store, Macintosh. It's available on iArcade. It's, the, it's available on about a dozen different uh, platforms and all, all, all the usual places. And it's only three bucks, but uh, I'm going to update. And it's going to have a lot of uh, new features, including uh, CRT effects, like scan lines, and, uh, uh, it, and uh, the ability to, to have multiple save points. Uh, I mean, the game, it had, uh, up until recently, it's been a nostalgia piece. And mm. it's something that I kind of wanted everyone to just, you know, have for, 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 for $3. But I, I do plan on raising raising the price. But you should still be able to get it for $3 for at least uh, the next uh, few weeks or so. So, yeah, you can get the game right now. And next year, we're going to have the two new versions uh, out there. We're really excited about them. Well, I'll link up the uh, the current release on Steam in our show notes so everyone can jump on and get warmed up for the uh, the big 40th anniversary uh, celebrations that are coming up soon. So, um, Rob, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and meeting you as well in, in a Pixel Heaven a couple of weeks ago. So, Yeah, best it was, of luck it was, with it it was great meeting you, and we're going to have to go out for a vegetarian dinner sometime when we get together. Yes, uh, 100%. Thank, and thank you so much for having me on The Retro. I had a great time with you guys. 